Well, um, firstly, uh, I, uh, I just feel that the, probably the people who didn't come probably felt my mood. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they would have been a bit challenged by that, so, <laughs> so that's all right. <laughs> um, so actually, what's going to happen today is all of you are paying for my mood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that how it is often too? How we we often are paying for other people's denial of emotion. Uh, so sorry about that today. <laughs> um, what I thought we'd do first today is uh, you may have had some questions rise last night that you like, that you feel that you could have asked Corny and and didn't. Um, so. What I was thought, what thought I thought we'd do firstly, is just open the discussion up again uh, for you to to ask corny questions, and then once uh, that's done, I well, can go sit way out of the way. He, he wants to retire, <laughs> 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 and uh, and then I'll uh, discuss this the handout that I've given you, and if you haven't got a handout, I've got more of them. So, um, but uh, the handout I gave you yesterday of the denial of the soul. So we'll discuss that uh, material with you today. <coughs> so, is there any questions you'd like to ask Corny specifically that came up uh, for you? I was wondering about this um, forgiveness kind of thing and part of your process or in just specifically just dealing with God. Just what comes up, yeah. It's like the enjoy part of it, I suppose, the forgiveness. It just happens automatically once you get through the causal emotion. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about forgiveness uh, at another session for a whole afternoon, actually, because of the principles of forgiveness. Yeah. There's two things going on for Corny. One is others forgiving him and him forgiving others. And uh, Corny's already, of course, paid all of the law of compensation things from the first century. So the emotions that he's working through now are really caused by the reincarnation process. So that's why he's got to work through the emotions again. Uh, is this your first or is this the first, are your first reincarnations still Yeah, the last one I hope too. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise it's triple that it had next time. And then after that quadruple, so it just gets more and more difficult. It would just be unbearable almost, I reckon. This is why the current principles of reincarnation as taught by other philosophies are obviously not true because it, 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 at, at each point of reincarnation you incarnate into parents who already have damage, all of your memories from all of your life go then through those emotional damages which just add each time, it would add each time to your emotional damage that you have to work through and it, it would become, if you were reincarnating into the world as it is today, it would become unbearable. Um, and you'd never work through anything. And in fact, there's, there's a whole discussion I have on, the, on reincarnation, which I might do again at some point, because um, I did it a few years ago. But uh, the, the teachings of reincarnation as they are proposed today by the majority of people um, have a lot of untruths in them, and they also have a lot of unloving things about them as well. And uh, once you understand what really happens at reincarnation, you can see why that's the case. So. Did both or either of you know about the process of reincarnation before you came into this lifetime? I have no memory of that stuff yet, and if I had, I wouldn't come back probably. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for the purpose of coming back, I suppose, in truth, it's really good. And that way to just try and help people understand, you know, everybody has that power within them. It's just to, to generate it, it's by removing all the errors. Most people don't understand how powerful they are and how loved they are as well. They just they're, they're actually something. They're not nothing. <coughs> no matter what condition you're already currently in, you're always something and can be loved. It's so possible. It's just there. It's just waiting for you. I, I do remember the choices that were made beforehand, and I do remember actually planning out the majority of this life. Uh, but. Uh, your viewpoint in the 20 second sphere is totally different than your viewpoint when you're here. <laughs> right? So your viewpoint there is like, oh, nothing is impossible, everything's fine, we're going to get through this, no worries at all, that kind of viewpoint. And uh, when you arrive, obviously, and you get hit with all of the emotions, now it's a different, different matter altogether. And so um, many of the 14 have been really, really overwhelmed. 
with their emotion as a result. And I've had times myself where I've felt like absolutely hopeless with regard to, you know, getting through everything that I know I need to get through. Was it that for? Was that for the time she let you? You thought that she let you just be abandoned. Is yeah, as a kid, end? I suppose you can't. You don't know the logic of why things happen. You just feel it. Yeah. And the feeling was just loss. Yeah. There's loss of love from a state of like one day or quite like all that time, just enjoying <laughs> life with a normal life with parents and stuff like that, and being loved and cared for. The next minute, you pretty much got the opposite scene happening on. We're just beaten and kicked and had buckets of you know, feces and stuff thrown around on you and stuff like that and just degraded to just a nothing. It's just such a contrast. There's just lots of, you know, why me? Why? I can't understand it. You just don't know why. So the fact that you realise at the end that your mother did love you, mm. um, you still have to go back and experience um, all the times that you felt she didn't love you. So you have to actually feel that, even though the yeah. knowledge that she loved you did what well, It doesn't matter what your head's telling you, it's just what your heart's saying. Yeah. And it's just what you're feeling about it, and that's yeah. where the truth's at. It's the emotional part. Yeah. Yeah. As I think my feelings a lot. I was always wondering why don't I feel much about my father in the first century. I always wondered why that was. It's more about mother. Yeah. But because I'm in this rank, kind of, if I'm coming back, my mother now, she has more feelings. A lot of my feelings from her, I can, there's lots of my father I find quite sort of open and loving. He's like open with that. But mum's a bit more shut down. And it's, I've talked to her about that and so I didn't feel loved when I was a kid, as in um, cared for, totally looked after really well. Yeah. But just um, the love I didn't feel come from her, like, I can't really remember being hugged by her. I'm sure it's happened, but I can't remember that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going by my feelings rather than trying to intellectualise out of it. But um, just didn't feel loved and that just resonated with all the feelings in the first century from my mum of not that loss of love. That's why all that stuff's coming up rather than much farther stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why... In the first century, feelings of coming up of um, just so much stuff, love from my mother that's coming up mainly, and the loss of that more importantly than my father. Maybe in those times, I can't know for sure or anything at the moment about that, just dealing with what I'm dealing with. But there's a lot more, like the kids always around the mother. It's a bit like now, the father's out doing things, he spends a lot more time with them and interacting with them. Yeah. And the fact that your, your emotions are related mainly with your mother, does that doesn't you're saying that it doesn't mean that you don't have issues with the father, it's just that they haven't come up yet. First century stuff? Yes. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, just haven't really touched any of that. Yeah, because I can't remember <coughs> in the first century if, father, if my father travelled to come up and find me and stuff, but that was just my mother, it was my sisters were involved with that at all. I had two sisters as well, two younger sisters. I have a feeling too when I was taken too, like um, when the soldiers come in, that um, they're just afraid, like for you know, the rest of the family as well. Mm -hmm. And to try and fight them, you know, it's gonna in, like they'd hurt my mum, hurt my sisters and stuff like that too. So it not it wasn't a nice place for women back then. It was a very, you know, it's very fragile, I suppose, to do anything against the authority, <coughs> already figures. So yeah, so in a way, it's just like letting go to save the families. That's what those feelings are for me. They're probably not true, but that's how I feel. It's like uncared for. Who cares about him? Let him go. Don't, don't try and save him. Mm. There's nothing come up about my father yet, and that's the reason why they took me as the qualities of my father. They'd already seen the qualities in him and thought I'd be good stock for them, sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. 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 Okay. Um, once before, Corny, when I was talking to you, you mentioned that you hadn't had any experiences of divine love in this lifetime? Not as far as I know, no. You, you haven't had any since? Not as far as I know. AJ believes so, but I'm so shut down that he's eating it here that at the moment too, so I don't know any difference. I haven't, so just dealing with the emotions, what I feel at the moment, and all that will become clear in the future. Yeah. I guess, it, in, logically, I guess I probably have, but 
No. Just not open to noticing it, I suppose. I thought you maybe you had because your face looks a lot clearer than last time I'd seen it. Yeah, I was dirty. It's got this crap on it. Than last time. <laughs> Thanks, I haven't, I haven't noticed that there, thanks. Good to see you, Anna. Hi, I was just keen to know your name in the first century. Oh, I know, that's, so, uh, yeah, he's Cornelius, I don't know any family name. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you answered a question of mine at some length yesterday, and <coughs> when I spoke to you at the end of the day, I was just... Um, sort of caught up emotionally and couldn't really say what I was, I'd forgotten what I was trying to say actually. But overnight a lot of things happened. Can I just relate it? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And because um, I was trying to imagine me in the position you've been in mm. and um, particularly around the crucifixion part of it. Mm. And you'd said that um, you saw the love in Christ's eyes and you couldn't continue on. Mm. And I was thinking, I mean, that's a really true thing for yourself to do, to walk away, even though you knew what the consequences were likely to be, were going to be. And what I realised was that in that situation, I'd have been a lot more pragmatic and thought, well, you know, he's not going to be going anywhere. He's not going to get out of this. I'll try and save myself mm. and try to shimmy out of it and probably, and would have continued with the process that yeah. was coming on me. And that brought up a lot of issues for me because... I suppose, like, growing up in Catholic school and stuff, and at times since I've been saying things like, Christ was the greatest uh, person on earth, we should all follow that example, even though we didn't know much about what it really was. And um, that was a huge, huge sort of, I suppose I was pretty much in emotional shock most of the day, not wanting to think about it. Yeah. But since I've worked through a bit of it <laughs> anyway, I just feel like, like uh, tons lighter. So thank you for describing that. It's yeah, welcome. Really there's still, there's still more in there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lighten up a bit more again once you let that come through. Yeah. Those feelings come up. Yeah. And I'm glad you got something out of it. That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. yeah, you're actually working through an issue of truth. Like, how important is the truth to you? Are you willing to act upon it in any situation, even if it's life-threatening? And that's something, Corny, in, in, that, in that space when at the crucifixion, Corny got to the point in himself that he just couldn't continue another evil act without, without stopping it, without actually turning it off. And, and every single person at some point in their progression gets to that point where you go through the emotions and then you realise that you cannot do anything more that would damage another person without harming yourself more. And once you get into that space, it's a very powerful space to be emotionally. Yeah, because it means that you're very, very willing after that to feel a lot of your emotions rather than projecting them onto other people. Yeah. I just wonder if you could elaborate on you know, what it was like back then, like what, what your memories are. Um, like it, it kind of sounds like a pretty lawless society with uh, you know, the, the rape and stuff that went on with women and like, what else, you, if you could paint a, I don't know, a bit of a picture for us of what you remember. <coughs> you can only say about that sort of stuff as in the horrible things that the people that were based on the injuries that happened to me, like with stuff against women, there's anger at my mum, just real anger, anger, anger towards women. Mm -hmm. They hurt me, so I wanted to hurt them and things like that. And children didn't want them to be happy because I was never happy. Never, my life was never good and stuff like that. And anger towards men because they, cause these people wanted that eventually and allowed that horrible feeling in to come. No one was going to ever come and save me. It's never, ever going to happen. And just letting that all just fall in on me. Then I changed my attitude. Okay, I'm here. And this is the rest of my life and I'm going to hate it. And I thought, I... Oh, I got to do something to like be something, so I tried to be as best as I could, and started to be. That's why I became who I was, I suppose, in that way. The anger was just a driving force then, and became good at being what they wanted me to be, because I wanted to be loved by someone. Mm -hmm. So I became, I wanted to be loved by just someone, and it became them. So they became my family, all the Roman soldiers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it was a pretty lawless, like, and corrupt kind of. Sounds like the Wild West kind of thing. Well, if you look at history back then, look at. 
society now, it's not a lot different really. There's just a little bit more law and around a bit more nice and stuff, but it hasn't changed a lot. There's still corruption and things like that. There's still people do things, you know, for their own purposes and their own selfishness and their own greed. And they're not con concerning what happens to other people or environment, things like that. It's just all about themselves, a lot of it. It hasn't changed a hell of a lot. Hmm. I think the major difference is that the injuries now are more controlled than mm. before. Um, back then it was like, a lot of times pretty much like anarchy. Mm. Um, whereas now, because most people accept law to a degree, there is at least more law. It doesn't mean the emotions inside of them are much different, but there's a lot more law that control their emotions that are negative. So, yeah. My friend Sonia has a spirit around here for a little while um, called Beth. And she was from that time as well, and eventually pieced it all together. Um, and she was, she remembered the Beth, the lady from the first century, remembers me, remembers my green eyes, really green eyes. And she remembers me looking at her and just noticing that she's pregnant and walking on, yet my soldiers that are with me end up raping her and killing her. This is in public, it's near an eatery sort of thing, whatever you call it, like a taverny sort of thing back then mm -hmm. in, in the streets. So there's no consequences, like there's no... Not with the soldiers who was going to do anything soldiers. against them. Yeah. Right, right. Because the soldiers I was with too, those in um, Jerusalem there, we were brought in because of... Well, basically to beef up the, um, the forces there, these just auxiliary forces there usually, in that area. And um, we were brought in because they are going to start taking, slice, taking a slice off the tax that the um, Jews took. The, um, it's a revenue they took every year off the, I can't remember what it's called. The temple tax. Temple tax, yeah. They took a slot, the, um, the guy, Sir Jonas, whatever, he's going to take a slice off that. And he didn't want any, that was non negotiable, so he didn't want any uprisings about it. So we were brought in, we were like crack sort of troops, sort of things, if you want to call it that. Called the Italian band, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's like elite forces kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. more well, right, well trained troops sort of thing came in, and were actually on the direct um, commander pilot. Wasn't, didn't have to go through anybody else. So whatever he said, he knew what was going on. That's what we were brought in for at that same time, actually. That's why I was there. It wasn't because of what Jesus was there for, but just because of that political situation at the time. You know, greed, corruption. Yeah. Uh, they just needed to back it up with some troops. Yeah. Connie was quite well off. Like, he, he had servants as well. Um, and he had a house. And so I was, was going to say, I was almost at the end of my time, too. There's some 20 something years he's got to serve before he can actually get out, which you usually get killed before then. Yeah. And, um, I was getting close to the end of my time to go too, so I'd, like you said there, I could have just, you know, kept my feelings shut down and shut down everything who I was and just gone on and just corrupted myself more or stood up and stayed in my truth. There's two choices of just, you know, do the years out and be hating everything I was doing or stand up. You've said, Cornelius, before that um, you've had people that you've harmed in the first century who have come to speak with you. Mm. Now, how do they know how to find you? Well, I was chatting one time, a couple of times, just been chatting about things. Once, one spirit was, I um, was talking to some people who were around Sonia's place one time, just chatting with them about stuff, and Sonia kept looking at me, and you now when she got something to say, she doesn't usually say it, but I just looked at her and she said, There's someone right in your face. And I'm going, just saying like, they're right there. And I said, okay, like, what's the attraction? I just didn't know if it's somebody that's wanted to know something or what it was about. And she said that um, he's just so angry with you. He's like touching your face and can't understand. So, and he's trying to hit me and swipe me. And she's like, why won't you die? And um, he was one, a spirit, once I got talking to him, just a little bit, he didn't want to talk at all. He's just so angry. Can you hear these or is this nah, through? Yeah, I can't hear them there yeah, through Sonia, a friend of mine. She isn't pretty clued onto that. Yeah. And um, she eventually can come through her like to talk rather than relaying it. I see. And um, he was angry at me. He was there when I was killed. He just couldn't understand how I was back like alive again sort of thing in, on earth. He's just so angry. He couldn't hurt me, but he's like taking swipes and stuff and angry that he couldn't harm me as well. Mm -hmm. He's so hurtful still because I killed his children and his wife as well. And um, he was really happy when I was killed. But yeah, I just talked to him a little bit about that, about the truth that his children are actually with him in the spirit world. They're probably in some better condition. It's just his anger was keeping him in the same place he's been for all this time. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
remember that uh, your spirit body isn't the real you either. So the, the real you is your soul. And so the memory record, there's a memory record that other spirits can actually see, depending on their development and how, how well developed they are. They can actually see your, your signature, if you like, as, or your individualization. So they'll know that it's you, even though they look at Corny's face and see a different face. And so, so they'll come to him even though, and the same happens to myself and all of the 14 too, that they, they come to us from experiences that we've had with them in the first century, but they're actually looking at a different face and they're a little bit confused about that. But they know that it's us because of the interaction they had with us at that time. So a spirit can just find you, and if they can, is it like, Putting out a beacon, going, I'm after such and such today, and you just yep, there. That that's happen? exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Sometimes our thoughts, like it's twice, it's happened with. Um, once I was talking to a lady, it's more in a natural love sort of belief and reincarnation, old theory sort of stuff, and she had some sexual abuse. A lot of sexual abuse stuff happened to her when she was younger, and I'm um, just talking to her one day, and I could feel like there's so much anger, and I was bringing up some stuff, and was, I felt like the anger was directed at me, and I just felt really uncomfortable about it. Mm -hmm. When I went home, I was just writing in my diary and just trying to get a bit more into the feeling, and um, I'm sleeping home, just going down my stairs, and it's just dawned on me, like, I wonder if I'd harm somebody in the, like, I must have harmed so many people. I wonder if there's still people still in that position. I thought, 2,000 years, you think, I think they'd move on sort of thing, like, they'd actually progress a little bit. It just like shocked me to think that there might be still somebody from my actions to feel bad about that. Yeah. That um is still there. Mm -hmm. And so ended up speaking to um I think ended up talking to Natalie, which is over in England at the time. She was quite good at the mediumship then and um emailed her and asked her mm -hmm. if she could ask her guide if there's anybody that's there. And um she said there was and we decided to connect up on Skype, just do a talk over the internet, just kind of channel over the internet to me. And um, I was quite scared about it too, and took a bucket in the room with me. Just didn't want to day face all that stuff. Yeah. Like things that just I'd done through my injuries. Yeah. Just have so much self-loathing. People like to believe in reincarnation and take on some nice thing, don't they? And why would you want to take on this shit? You know. What would you want to even like accept an identity like that? <clears throat> and anyway, started speaking to her. She didn't really want to speak to me, but it was encouraged by the spirit guides that with her to speak to me. And we're just talking about her life a little bit, and um, just let her talk as much as possible because I had no idea what to say. Just had no idea. She just hated me, like really, really hated me, and um, just. She'd been raped by me and some of my troop guys as well. And um, she died from injuries. And she had a little girl, just a little newborn, and she's just so like, lost about what happened to her. And I just got to talking about her, that she's in the spirit world with her, but that meant nothing. There's just, just so much pain from the loss. And I um, just got talking to her about her life a bit more, and she's just scared her whole life as a woman scared and you know, she had, I said there must be just one time you can remember in your life you were happy is there one time and she remembered a time and she was by herself walking around the lake it's the only time she remembers being feeling nice and just happy and um just talked to her a little bit more and um she started to sort of realize a few things and told her what happened to me she died before me just told her what happened to me and she was really happy that i got hurt so much as well um just you know how much People hate you, sort of thing. It's just not nice. And I'm just hearing that they're so happy how much you got hurt. And um, I just spoke to her a bit more, and then didn't feel like that went very well. I sort of finished it and didn't feel like it went very well. I just went up and cried. And um, but since she's been doing really well, she's got really like it's helped her a lot. She's moved forward quite rapidly, which is really good. Yeah. Where is she now? <coughs> I don't know. She's in probably. It's not in the celestials yet. We still got a lot of stuff to work through. I think she's in the third actually. Mm. And um, and helping these spirits, like anybody that's meeting Mystic here, that can help help the truth. These spirits, they're just so 
thankful for it. Mm. If you can imagine being stuck somewhere in such a horrible place, just even in your own emotions, and how long you can be stuck in something for so long, and how horrible it is. If someone can just teach you a truth and help you get out of there to a happier place, they're like a friend forever. They are, they're just so thankful. So it's nice in a way too to be able to help, especially these people that you know I've harmed or done something to. I couldn't feel anything, so, and I think there's a band of spirits around me that don't allow that to. But the truth is, they can harm you, um, particularly with their emotions and your emotions. So, if your emotions are in sympathy with their emotions, they can harm you through that connection. Yeah. So, it's more emotional. Uh, you, they can do physical things to you because of that emotional thing. So they could in, they could even do things like cause you to go into self harm, for example, or mm -hmm. cause. So a lot of the so called psychotic behaviours that occur mm -hmm. on Earth today are all usually related to spirit attachments um, affecting the person on Earth. So yeah, I've, I've got a friend who's who experiences schizophrenia, yeah. and he often talks about um, like he, he calls them spirit. Um, uh, Sort of latching onto him and yep. drawing energy out of his That's what they do, yeah. He's aware of that, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And they draw energy out of you mm -hmm. emotionally, like it's to do with your emotional condition, and that's why the energy flows out of you to them. So, but yeah, they can certainly harm you. And they can also cause major physical damage to your body, even, even your own death. Is there something you can do, like put up a, something to do to, with the emotion? Yeah, deal with the emotion, like we've been yeah. saying. So there's, deal no with the emotion, there. there's no attraction there. There's no attraction. I'm pretty nice before. Um, I think I'm. I think I'm sort of under, starting to understand the process of owning our own emotions <coughs> and the progression part of it. Yep. But in, like in, in your case, can you where there are all these people that you harmed? in the spirit world as you were moving up through the, the different spheres mm. you must have come across some of them there but you can get to the 22nd sphere and wouldn't you be trying to locate and assist people that you'd harmed along the way? Like AJ can talk here but if it's up to the person's want or their will to want help and to listen or to want help to move from where they are and you can't force them to you can go and certainly talk to them but if they're not willing to listen to you so imagine me going back and talking to them they already feel this thing about me now imagine back then too all this time they want to listen to me the person that's harmed them to try and help them it's possibly not but you can yeah you can try you're always worth trying and you keep trying but a lot of times it's people they're more they can resonate better with I was told in some of the writing I was doing that the communication from someone here is often <coughs> much less threatening yeah. to a spirit than from another spirit because mm. it's more manageable, less scary. Mm. They've already experienced an earth life and they're quite comfortable knowing about that. It's, you know, they know something about that, they feel comfortable. So mm -hmm. the spirit worlds don't really know what goes on sometimes. They don't know why they are where they are. Mm -hmm. They all the times resonate back to what they know, like we do, I suppose, too. It's much easier for you to talk to a person here in the physical than it is to talk to a spirit, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the same for them when they're in the spirit world. It's much easier for them to talk to somebody who's in a position they can see clearly than someone who's above them in this condition of love that they can't see clearly. Mm -hmm. So so often, yeah, look, one of the things I would like to accomplish over the coming years is to have whole groups of mediums being educated about how to help spirits on the divine love path mm -hmm. because it's such a powerful thing that can be done this interaction with the spirit world very powerful it, it also destroys a lot of connections between spirits who are in their first sphere or on the earth plane uh, and people on earth keeping them in the same state if you can if you can cut that connection by helping the spirit move on then it creates a lot of freedom for people on earth as well so there's a lot of really positive things that can be done by mediums but at the moment a lot of times mediums are receiving information from spirits to the earth 
but a lot of the information they're receiving from spirits is actually from first fear spirits anyway. And, and it doesn't help either party really, it doesn't help the people on earth or the spirit. Whereas if there was a, a, a sort of a complete reversal of that and where mediums on earth concentrated on assisting spirits, so after they've developed some themselves can assist some spirits, then, it, then there's a huge powerful effect of that in the spirit world but also here on earth. Because those spirits help their other mates too, when they move on they wonder where the person's gone, the person can revisit that sphere because they're higher than it now and explain how they got out of there mm. and they can help all those ones that are with them. Mm. And the ones in that sort of state can, like they won't go be attracted to your friend anymore once they move on too. So by helping the spirits it helps everybody, it helps to help clear the spirit world, it helps them to elevate, it helps them not be interested in affecting people on earth or harming people, it allows the people on earth just to deal with their own stuff rather than what spirits project things on them, but it's just a big loving way all around. So I've actually helped like 50,000 spirits at one time even, at times. So, and every, any person can do it. It's just a matter of talking through a medium to a group of spirits that have been assembled. Because there, there's a lot of spirits who badly want to know truth. And they're in the first sphere, but they can't connect to higher spirits. They find them scary, they're frightened of them, and so they, you know, they can connect to someone on earth because the person on earth is the condition they used to be in. So that, so it's something that they can still relate to. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering where God was in all of this. You know, like it just seems like you're born into this horrible existence. Like was there a plan before you guys came down that you agreed to and a, a meaning to it? God's yeah. always in the same place all the time. <laughs> what? God's always in the same place all the time. Just whether we're not going to be wanting to be with God. They want to have a desire for God. God doesn't disappear. I mean, we disappear from God. That's all. But in answer to your question, yeah, there is a plan, mm -hmm. obviously. And, you know, one of the reasons why we've returned is because it's God's plan, not ours. Um, but uh, God had, God's original plan is what God wants to re-establish, basically. And man, through the issue of self-reliance, has walked away from that plan. And so if we can re-establish God-reliance in a person's attitude and life, then what happens is that a lot of these errors and badness and all this evil that we experience and all these really sad emotions and grieving emotions and all this pain that we're experiencing, the next generations of people will never ever need to even experience them. So you'll get to a point in a few generations if, you know, if things go as planned, You'll get to a point in a few generations where there'll be people born on earth with no emotional injuries at all. And that was the original plan. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So if you're born with no emotional injury, then what would you do? Yeah, there's a common concept that uh, we come here to work through emotional injuries, but that's not true. We can't, the, the, the physical is the, is the um, you could call it the nursery of the soul. And so God's original intention was that the nursery of the soul was perfect, just like all other parts of his universe. And it still is perfect, but harmed by man's choice to walk away from God. But we, these injuries of the soul create the imperfections that we see in the universe around us. If we can allow ourselves to work through those injuries, then what happens is everything comes very, very clear very rapidly. So God, God's intention was to have the earth free of injuries, but every person, remember the, the point of incarnation is not to pay for karma, but the point of incarnation is to get individualization, is to actually become consciously aware of yourself as an emotional being. So that's the point of incarnation, and that, that's what this physical universe accomplishes. The actual, the actual individualization of each one of us we become individuals and then we grow as individuals throughout you know throughout history throughout the future but also in the spirit world throughout the dimensions as well so that's the point of incarnation the point of incarnation isn't to come here to have a bad experience so you learn something that's not the point of incarnation but that is a common theory that is proposed today when you think about it it's not a very loving theory, mm -hmm. is it? Like, would you create a whole amount of children and then force them to go through all of these terrible, traumatic 
emotional negative experiences just so they learn something. You wouldn't do that to your own child, so why would you feel that God would do that to you? All right? So the, the truth is actually that God created a perfect universe for the nurturing of the soul and a per perfect physical space for the nurturing of the soul. But man's free will choices cause man to go in this spiral of degradation, walking away from God. And that is what is causing our pain. That is what is causing the evil. And that is what is causing all of our emotional pain that we're now needing to work through. It's not that God originally intended that because in, in, in other worlds, God, uh, like people are born with no emotional injuries and they spend years, I mean like hundreds and hundreds of years in their physical state, working through all the different things, enjoying their life and then pass into the spirit state and, and so forth without these injuries occurring that are occurring here on earth. I really identify with your journey, Corny. But you my speak question, a bit louder. The, the um, I really identify with Corny's journey, but I am still having a difficulty. And so my question is, how do you then reconcile with hearing the call of your parents to come and then suffering from that point forward? Why? I I want to thank you for talking about your journey because it's helped me connect really deeply with my own personal experience. So how how you how had do the you answer reconcile? right then a few seconds ago? The answer was already there. What? You're doing it. You're feeling it emotionally. You got you started letting it come and you shut it down. <laughs> You're feeling that sadness and that, that sorrow for all the things that happened. Listening to the other person's mm. conversation. Yeah, there's a lot of things I noticed from a personality in the first century. There must have been a lot of courage, I think. And then I ask actually God a lot of times to please show me the courage I must know that's a part of me to help me try and face some of these emotions that I need to face, to try and just remove them, like you say, to try and find the true self. I need to remove the stuff that's covering all that. So I know that's a, qual a trait of me or a quality of my soul. I need to try and re refine. A lot of times I feel quite scared to try and go and love this stuff. Mm. Yeah. So, so did you find it all when you got to the 20 second sphere? Is that what one does? Find all those parts? I can't answer that because I can't remember any of that this moment. Well, the question that I did originally want to know is how is that now apparent in this return, in your reincarnation? How is the personality now being affected, or your true self, or your soul <coughs> being affected by the your experiences of double experiences of your feeling now, as well as your first century? Do, do you know what my question is? I'm going to ask AJ if he understands you better than I do. Do you understand what she's asking? <laughs> she wants to know what. Um, how, how your experience in this life has, and, and your experiences that you remember in the spirit life and in the first life, how has that modified your personality? How has that changed you? My personality now? Yeah. Mm. Do you yes, feel it has? I guess it's by, um, I don't know actually, I'm just trying to face with whatever comes up now. And I guess I'm a hell of a lot more loving. 
So it's one thing I really understood. But that, a lot of it depends on when you incarnate, what your emotions your parents are. It's going to just um, put energy back into any of the memories you've had from the first century and reignite them sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it really it depends a lot on them, I guess. That's why I, th I feel so, so thankful that the parents I've had now have been really good in that way. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very thankful because I wouldn't want to go through a lot of other stuff that I would have to go through again. Yeah, like this stuff is a joy, I suppose, feeling unloved. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably more of a joy than you know harming people and things like having that desire to you know, like, I had that feeling back in the first century right of feeling unloved but now I don't have a feeling I want to harm people and then bring that back in because there's no desire like no, I don't know why that is but just I'm happy that it's not there. Mm. Yeah. Perhaps like um, I'm not really clear on my question myself but it relates to finding the person that you are and uh -huh. it relates to my own search of finding who am I really yeah. underneath all of this stuff that mm. I carry around and cover up and think I am, but I've discovered I'm not anything that I thought I was. Mm. In fact, I haven't got a clue. Your answer's in your question too. It's <laughs> yeah. all the things that are covering it. Yeah. yeah. So Once you <laughs> start removing all those things that, you know, all the fakeness that we all feel like we have to be and mm. should be and everybody expects us to be, yeah. all that fake mm. stuff, all that crap yeah. that's on the surface, all the mud. Once you start washing all that off, we can actually see who we are, truly. Yes, so but you're trying to intellectually know who you are before you experience it emotionally? No. That, so this is why you want to ask the question? You want to ask the question because you want to know who you are and whether who you are is going to be not good enough for what you can see. Like, you, you're worried about whether it's going to be good enough or whether you're going to be ashamed of who you are in the end. Or so go into those feelings So go first. into those feelings, yeah. Yeah. Feeling just afraid of what's going to happen when you start standing in your own truth and all these feelings are going to be, you know, have to be faced. Yeah. What's going to happen? Just go to the fears of all those. But the truth is you will find who you are once you've released all of the injuries. Yeah. A lot of times we define ourselves by our injuries, don't we? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we think we're a certain type of person because of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. but, but in reality, a lot of times the person we believe ourselves to be is not the real us. It's just the us added with some injuries and the injuries might be there to make us feel a bit more powerful or make us to feel a bit more feminine or masculine or whatever it is that we're missing within ourselves. And so what we do is we focus on the injuries and we hold on to them for dear life sometimes. And the key is just to not hold on to anything like that, just to let yourself release these emotions because you'll find your true self once you do that. You don't have to go looking for it, but just if you act in truth it will reveal it mm. automatically. Once you start accepting the truth about things emotionally, it'll start, you know, you get down to the cause of why you're even there and those horrible things that aren't, you know, part of you really. And then it'll start revealing. Once you go through that emotionally, it just reveals who you are. You start, go, don't go looking in here. Any other questions for Connie? I get to sit, uh, sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you get really clear visuals of your first century life? Like Not really. I get um, some things, usually after I've been crying, stuff like about things, going through some stuff, but um, not a lot of stuff really. Just more, everything's really feeling based. A lot of it is. Just a lot of it's just all feeling based. I'm not medium mystic as far as I know, so I don't really get anything like that. But um, you don't get faces of people that you knew sort of pop up. Sometimes it's more things just happen. Sensing of them, that there's, person. There's small things. There's memories like um, when a soldiers come into the little house and stuff like that that we're living in. There's that. There's some. There's one just in like on the ground, sort of muddy stuff and hay sort of things, and, and some sort of wood thing always curled up in the corner. Just like feeling pretty terrible. Um, as a kid, just scared of everything, you know, all these the big men and stuff like that. Um, there's other ones that we can't quite often. There's one that's spirit world quite often. That's been a ball on the ground, it's just dark and cold, and just don't want anybody near me. Um, there's one that's been led to where the execution is. This one's leaving it, um, your execution. Um, Yeah, there's not. There's just a lot of the things I've gone through, though, emotionally too, and some are still going to continue through. Mm. So those just come with the feelings when the feeling starts coming up, and you go through all the 
sadness that's involved with those and the grief, that's things just sort of come up. But nothing before. So all of the 14 have had this experience, or most of them, that they can't remember anything at all until they start processing emotion. And then they start remembering things. And then as they're processing more and more emotion, it's a bit like you with your childhood, if you had an abusive childhood or things like that. You, you'll have blocked away all sorts of whole groups of your life. And, and all you need to do is allow the emotions to become present. And what will happen is you'll remember those events straight, you know, soon after that. But obviously if the emotions are really traumatic, it can take some time for you to actually allow yourself to experience those emotions and allow the pictures that, uh, that those emotions bring to enter you and, and come into your mind. So the majority of the 14 are still struggling with that process because it's, uh, it, cause most of our memories from the first century are quite traumatic. I remember my mother's eyes too, and being pinned on the ground. You just sort of see between legs. I just see her looking like down below the legs, etc. Trying to see me because lots of people sort of still watching. David, how old were you when you first started having, or first started dealing with the emotions? Uh, enough to get your first bits of idea that you were calling I, uh, I didn't want to even go anywhere down that track. Um, so I didn't even I heard about this 14 and thought it was just a pack of all these idiots sort of thing, really. Excuse myself for you, but um, <laughs> I just didn't. I thought it was all religious stuff or whatever, because most of them were like religious characters, which I didn't really like. And um, I think one of the ladies asked sitting around once and she was curious to know who the others were and stuff and she's asking questions. She asked if she was one, if somebody else there was one and if then the question came to me if I was one, he sort of said yeah because he can't not lie and um, <laughs> and by his feelings and I kind of wasn't really surprised but I didn't want to tell anybody else that um, and just let it be for a while sort of thing, didn't really take any credence of it and um, I think the moment, the pivotal moment I think with everything was it's around Tanya's, we were having dinner there one night when you were over, and um, I was relaying to AJ some story of sort of saying, I split up with a girlfriend, I was explaining to her my feelings about something that, um, that felt like, I was explaining a story, I don't know why, it was something to do with our relationship, but it felt, I was explaining this story, it feels like um, we're together, me and her sort of thing, and um, somebody had said something bad about me, or somebody else that wanted her had said something against me to put her off me, and then um, then there's somebody in power too, and that person in power, uh, it was something that was life, whatever I was supposed to have done, it put me in a really bad spot where I was actually killed for it, and um, she was like hurt against whatever I'd done, like hated me for it or you know, had it was right against me, so I didn't sort of the heart that hurt her see me die, but it's not hurt. Can't explain it really. Anyway, that person got like wanted her, got her because I was out of the way now. But they, when she was with this person, she started to realise that I was telling the truth all the time about denying this will ever happen. But whatever it was that I supposedly said I got executed for, they tried to get me in trouble for. And um, she had this realisation that I was telling the truth all along, but she's now with this person that she, you know, she had these like, horrible guilt feelings, and I was in the spirit world, I'm dead. And um, I don't know why I was explaining that to her, but it was something to do with our relationship. And as I was telling AJ about that, um, he was saying, do you think that might have happened? And I just started crying and crying, and um, then he, after I was crying for a little while, I sort of stopped a bit and said, do you have any idea what your name might be? I just sort of set it out. Yeah. I've never heard that name in my life before. Been a non avid rock bubble person. <laughs> <laughs> but also, what happened before then for Connie was that uh, he did a lot of sort of what you call imagery type work, didn't he? I was you? before I knew any of that stuff. Before, I've been doing lots of stuff all my life, really. Just, I've always been scared all my life. Um, 
I always never wanted to be in a fight and stuff like that. Then worried am I a pussy or something like that? Because <laughs> men are supposed to be in fights and things like that and having this little turmoil inside, but not wanting to ever be in a fight. Don't want to harm anybody, don't want to be harmed myself. Um, and then lots of, real lots of fear about death, pretty much from around my teens. When I first actually got into a relationship, there's a real deep, strong love relationship. That's when a lot of this death stuff come up. I've been afraid of it and mm -hmm. just, just freaked myself out. I'd be lying in bed trying to get to sleep and thinking, what happens? Like, we're in this life for this little blip of time. What happens after that? What happens? There's just a big nothing after that. It's just to freak mm -hmm. myself out and have to run out of my bedroom and just like, get, just get away from it, get, try and get the thoughts out of my head. I just went into the toilet once and then smashing my head on the toilet just to try and split that a bit and just had to try and get away from it. it used to freak me out. Um, try not to think about death, what happens. I just wanted to live forever. Um, I just always wondered about life, like what's it all about? What's a, what's a purpose? There's got to be a purpose. It has to be. It's just pointless otherwise. There has to be something, but no one then knows what it is, it seems like. So there's always this inner search of trying to find out what the hell it's all about. So I had no idea. I didn't feel very comfortable about it. <laughs> um, and then went through relationships and stuff like that and had a big turmoil in one relationship and went around to mum and dad's and I remember just talking to them and just burst into tears and just, I can't, just hold it, dad just fell to the floor. Just couldn't, I couldn't stand up anymore. It was just complete like surrender. Just on the floor, a little curled up ball in fetal position, just bawling my eyes out and just, I kind of felt <laughs> I was noticing my own stuff, but I noticed that around me. I felt sorry for them now because I looked like trying to, you know, this dude on the ground just bawling his eyes out, and there's nothing they could do. Just the helpless feeling come up and felt sorry for them. There's nothing they could do as well. And um, Mum suggested this lady to go and see so and did some sessions with her, guided imagery sessions with classical music, where the lady just gets you relaxed and you go into sort of like just a relaxed state, and she puts this certain classical music on that suits whatever mood or whatever we've been talking about, and just let's just, you go into your own sort of visions really and um, just talk you through them and we just you can explain what you're seeing and she'll talk a little bit about a particular point of that maybe, if like focus in an area and it just brings up so much stuff. Had lots and lots of stuff come up in that. Nothing about this stuff but all through my life had all these different strange experiences that I've never been able to explain. So I just got a thought that's interesting and I thought I don't know what it means, don't know what it's about and thought just Yep, chuck it over there. It was like my little jigsaw puzzle book. I kind of kept memories in of experiences and I thought maybe one day that'll make some sense. And then eventually I kind of did. Yeah. Pull them back out of the cupboard and put a little picture together at last, like part of it. Is that kind of part of your it does. It's, answer? Yeah. I just wanted to know the process. Mm. Mm. Thank you. No it's not been, like I've been denying a lot of the it's only been probably, and I'm still not in a full state of accepting either. Um, denying a lot of it too, because it's just, for me it's kind of weird for a start. Um, emotionally it's kind of difficult. Um, it's difficult just to... This brings up all those feelings again of being hated by everybody because the funny thing I'm not getting them. <laughs> like you guys are fine and stuff like but to express it in truth again out to the world it's just to like friends family and stuff like that some of my family know and some of my friends know but to express it fully it feels like being rejected again because it's all kind of weird <laughs> so it's a lot of avoidance because of that it's not like it's going to bring up that emotion um, there's a lot of other things I guess in it too. What it all means, I'm scared to even look at the big picture of it all, what it means. Um, there's just lots of things that don't want to accept about it and we try to deny many things. I've tried both ways, trying to deny and just go on with life and do the usual thing. It feels quite boring and uncomfortable actually just if you run a life. and. Um, then just try the acceptance part of it and it, bring, it brings more emotion up and so just try to stick on that track whatever sort of makes things bring emotion up works otherwise just feel shut down and it feels <coughs> really uncomfortable too so I'd rather go with the discomfort and get through that the emotional part of it and it brings a lot more joy than the just denying just, just constant discomfort it's just going with what's kind of working at the moment
and then I'm trying to refute it <coughs> if things come up and think that it must be spirit influence and try and look at like how it could be lots of react lots of my emotions is that and how would I attract that I try and look down that avenue to try and push it away as well and that hasn't really given any answers either unfortunately as in to try and push it away I'd like it to be gone away um, just just pushing through I suppose and just see what happens so I don't know it does bring up a lot of stuff that still needs to come up, so if that's in me, it's in me, so it needs to come up. Listening to all of that, I feel like, although, I mean, I haven't, I thought I'd be in kind of heavy, but <laughs> haven't, but I feel that even in my first, this life, um, I'm going through the same process, and I guess everyone is, mm -hmm. of just uh, moving through what's there. Yeah. Yeah. You'll eventually find the truth anyway. Once you do that process, just going down the emotional track and really expose the truth. Yeah. There's a lot of time I went to, you know, after looking, not knowing, after being scared of death and stuff, and um, started looking at, you know, this new agey sort of stuff and see what they sort of thought about things. I had no faith in religions or anything, telling me much. And um, so I kind of went down that track looking at that and. Then the reincarnation, and once I heard about that, I thought that's kind of okay. I suppose that maybe helps take a bit of the fear of death away. That's just covering up what I was feeling <laughs> in the end. And um, but it didn't make sense to me after a while. Like, why would, why would people keep coming back for? Like, what's the purpose? It's got to be a purpose. It always has to be a purpose. Does it help you get any better? Does it? How does it improve? Are you happier? Or, thanks. I couldn't understand this cycle of unhappiness it seemed to be. People talk, and everybody that seemed to talk about reincarnation was always, you know, somebody. But why wasn't somebody just a shitty sh street sweeper from 3,000 years ago or something like that? No one was that, were they? <laughs> they're not. They just want to feel it's like an ego based sort of thing. Almost, trying to feel good about themselves or trying to promote a feeling they don't have already. So I can sort of start to see now that a lot of that was based on that. It was actually covering up a lot of people's emotional injuries. When I spoke to different people think they're reincarnated sort of thing, I could sort of start seeing behind the emotions that they had already in them after knowing them for a little while. You start to see what they're covering up with that. And I thought, okay. And it didn't make sense to me too because I couldn't, because I tried to use this model of the spheres to try and use the reincarnation keep coming back theory. And I couldn't find, there's one thing I could not find in that and that was that there was no love in that, in that process. I couldn't find it. There had to be love that had to fit in there somewhere. It's a just strong and believing in that love is, you know, it's the, the link that binds the universe together. Um, I couldn't find it in that process, so I thought, can't be then, like, okay, I have to try and go on your version. <laughs> but, um, just went with that and had a lot more love involved in it, so I had a lot more truth involved in it then too. I've used that a lot now to try and determine what's truth and just looking at does it contain love in it and not just my version, because <laughs> you know, our own versions are tainted. And just look at it and just really look at it. Does it really contain love? Mm -hmm. To try and find some truth. So I'd, I'd like to listen to a lot of what things people have said, but just um, just take this, listen to it, but only start taking on a bit more if it does have a lot of love and truth in it. Yeah, so I'd like to try and you know, go on different avenues, looked at towers and looked at um, Buddhism and stuff like that, and just different avenues. Of, you know, I was looking all over the place just trying to find something. You know, looking at crystals and all this sort of healing, healing stuff, um, Reiki, all that sort of stuff, and just trying to find any different aven any avenue I could find to try and find some truth somewhere in the universe, in the world. Just trying to find some happiness and peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then suddenly when I met John, he's doing those classes with all this stuff come up, and it was quite confronting a lot of the stuff. It <coughs> confronted a lot of things I'd taken on to cover my stuff up, like to cover um, fears and things, and um, I never really took those on fully either because didn't really, they didn't gel for some reason. But a lot of this stuff about, you know, it just makes sense. Mm. Just feel it. It just makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Unfortunately, then there's a 14 part mm. you've got to try and have a look at for me. You know, if just a, it's just a general life, you know, great. We'll stop there and just continue on with that. But then there's all these other stuff coming up now too. <coughs> with, you know, being reincarnated. And I just threw that theory out the window about the old ones. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of feel like a little crazy sometimes about about that, you know, you don't know where you're with, without it. And sometimes it just feels like a load of crap and other times it makes complete sense, mm -hmm. the reincarnation part sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you have to look, okay, I have to go back, where's the love in it? Okay, look at that process again. 
And this is the way you kind of find some truth. Keep looking for that love. So you go hand in hand. It's really wonderful, Corny, that you're here. Mm. Because you're such a courageous man to be speaking your truth. Yeah. And that's so value to me personally. Because my law of attraction over a long period of time has attracted lots of crappy men mm. who didn't have courage, who didn't have what you you are embodying your your journey. And mm. that being here, experiencing your warmth and your goodness and the courage that you're showing by sharing your journey, that is so affirming for me. It 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 just Profound. I don't even understand how to say the words of how much it affects me to see you speak your words and tell your journey and show your courage and <coughs> it's... I, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. But you have to be open to it, so I'm still thanking you. <laughs> <laughs> so feeling it, I mean, you have to be open to feeling it, you're feeling it, so I thank yeah, you. Because yeah. I'm shit scared, I'm afraid, I'm really scared. Courageous men are just so wonderful. I'm scared like and all you guys get, are too. I'm getting, getting more courageous men, more wonderful men in my life, and... It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful that the law of attraction changes and that, you know, you guys aren't bad guys anymore. That's good, Jenny. Because I'm the same as you guys. I'm scared too. I'm really scared of all the stuff we're going to face. Just like you guys, now you'll use, well, AJ will probably go into that soon, but denial tools that we all seem to use to try and cover up with mm -hmm. the fears so we don't have to go to these places that we're afraid of and just see our true selves and see the ugliness inside of ourselves that we don't want to look at mm -hmm. it's not the true us anyway it's just the parts that have just been infected really mm -hmm. just need clear cleaning mm -hmm. and healing so I'm scared like you guys Spirit world. In the spirit world, yeah. I don't even know that. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I didn't know. Well, oh, you went through your emotions. Yeah. I suppose you'd cry if you're feeling it, wouldn't you? I suppose you'd cry, like, cry yeah. if you're feeling it. I didn't even think of that in the spirit world, yeah. But, but you did cry. Oh, definitely in the spirit world, yeah. And you didn't feel the teardrops dropping? I don't even feel it when I'm doing it now. I feel a snot coming out my nose. That seems to be really prominent. Boy, I relate. So yours is longer. <laughs> Someone's a hanky. I don't put that in your pocket. <laughs> Happy that there's tears in the spirit world. But there is tears in the spirit world. And, and when you cry, you cry tears of joy as well as sorrow. And what do they do when you have a snot in the spirit world? <laughs> must do something. Must it doesn't get stuck on you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of divine truths? Yeah, because I guess one of the questions I wanted to ask him was, was like how this felt more like the truth than something else feeling true. And you sort of answered that in your last, you know, when you were talking. But for me, I, I think that, you know, I want to be out of denial and this sort of thing. And I can feel resistance in... Is this the truth, or I found other things that feel like the truth, mm -hmm. but I feel drawn to explore this. This is my first weekend, mm -hmm. and um, so is there a feeling that comes with knowing or feeling that this is the truth? We'll talk about that a little more in our discussion a bit later, because it's um, the truth. The truth. All of us at this moment are in a state of error, from God's perspective. I'm talking about not our own perspective. 
So from our own perspective, a lot of times we think we know the truth or we feel something is truth. But in reality, what is often happening is that our um, emotions, our unhealed emotions are saying it's truthful. But if we healed those emotions, we'd then recognize the error in what's, being, in what's happening. For example, uh, like, for example in, a, in a loving relationship, you may be in a relationship that you believe is loving, but when you recognize certain more ones of God's truths entering you, you may come to a point where you see that you haven't been loving in this relationship when you thought you had. And that often happens with our relationships with our children, for example, where we thought we were loving towards them, but there's damage occurring to our children that when they grow up, they express that damage back to us. And so therefore, we now know that actually we weren't loving to our children. There must have been an error involved in our love. And what Corny is describing is when you actually experience your emotional error, in other words, allow all of your emotional error to be experienced, what also comes to you is truth, God's truth, as a result of that. It's when you shut down yourself or you get into a state of resistance or you get into a state of anger or, and we'll talk about these states of denial in a minute. When, when you get into these states of denial, that's when you can no longer actually know the truth in your heart and you now have to try to figure things out in your head. Right? So it's the process of actually opening up fully to, to all of your emotional denial and then allowing all of the emotions to flow through you once you do that, then God can tell you the truth. Before then, you can only sort out the truth based on your own feelings and, and emotions, which will often be in error. Yeah. So it's important to understand that often we're feeling something is true because of an emotional error. Right? And, and it's only when we release that error that we'll know the truth. And so what we need to then do is learn how to identify our own emotional errors and we identify our own resistances, and that's part of what the discussion will be about today. Yeah. Any more questions for the man? Going once? Oh, I, <laughs> no, I want him to stay for a sec, because uh, there were some things that, um, there's some qualities inside of Cornelius that I haven't mentioned from the first century. and. When I first heard from him, we had an interaction where I actually heard from one of his servants. One of his servants came to me and said, oh, my master wants you to heal another servant of his. And, and, uh, and I asked about who, this, who the master of this servant was, and it was Cornelius. And Cornelius had sent this servant um, to ask me whether I could heal his other servant. And I asked him, well, why didn't Cornelius come himself? And the explanation that Cornelius gave me through his servant was that, that he knew that he was in power over people. And he knew that he could send people on his behalf to get things done rather than him personally having to do it. And so he felt that I must be able to do the same thing. And it was actually true. And I actually made a comment to the crowd that was with me at the time that I've never seen as much faith in a person as this man who I'd not yet actually spoken to, which was actually Cornelius. So one of the things that uh, caused Cornelius to change besides the love that he experienced inside of his soul was actually the faith that he had about how things work in terms of being able to you know, trust that that healings could occur, for example. And so his servant was healed that day. Um, I didn't go there to heal his servant. All I did was ask my father to heal his servant, and he was healed that day. And, uh, and that was one of the things that also built Cornelius's trust in the message that I was teaching at the time. So even though we had not had a per personal interaction, I already knew quite a lot about him. Uh, from those interactions that I'd had watching him in the distance, um, being present at some discussions, but also in that interaction with healing his servant. Did, how did Cornelius know that you healed a servant if you weren't there? Um, he, that's what I'm saying. He didn't know, but he, but he, he, felt, he felt that that would be the case. I see. Yeah. yeah so, and because of his faith, that actually is what could occur. 
and, uh, and, and there was very little of that kind of faith, even in amongst the Jews at that particular time. Yeah. So, I don't so recall that. It's so encouraging that if, that through faith, we have faith in the message and don't always know perhaps what it is that's right deep down. But that exercise of having faith and believing is em empowers it. Mm. That's what you're saying. That's right. Yeah, faith, and that's why I said in the first century that the faith the side of a mustard seed, and you, you know how big a mustard seed is, right, can move a mountain. Mm. Right? So I suppose in some ways it's making a comment about how much faith we actually have. Because <laughs> 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 nobody's moving many mountains at this point. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it also illustrates that, uh, this, that faith is a very, very powerful thing. And once you start gathering faith in your own life, and particularly faith about a connection with God, things will change very rapidly after that point for you emotionally and in terms of how happy you are inside of yourself. So that, and that was a quality. I, I know Corny hasn't had that memory yet of that experience, but it was one of, that's one of my memories of the interactions between us in the first century that stands out in my mind. And it stood, it stood out then at the time in my mind because of just how little faith there was with the people that I was teaching at the time. And yet here was this centurion who was a Roman soldier, not even a Jew, who had hardly spent any time listening to me, who had more faith than many of the people who had been listening to me at the time. And you just took a sort of view about healing the servant. Like, um, if all illnesses are emotionally based, um, how, is it that you, how is it that you or we can heal other people when isn't it about emotionally processing and taking a I mentioned a bit about this yesterday. Um, there are two types of healing. One is through a spirit, a spirit healing the person. And usually a six fear spirit will do that or a spirit on the natural love path under the six fear might be connected with the person and healing them. And that's most of the spiritual healing that is happening today, including ones that are quite powerful with it, like John of God and those kind of persons. Most of the spiritual healing is occurring through that method. There's no spiritual healing occurring in the method that I used in the first century at this point. And that spiritual healing is when you become at one with God, basically because of that connection with God, you can direct God's, you, you can, God can direct her energy or her love through you to heal anyone you choose as long as that person is open to dealing with their emotions that created that injury. Uh, no, just the just the willingness to experience the emotion has to come first. Yeah, and um, because remember, God doesn't God doesn't expect you if you're connecting to God in the divine love way. God doesn't expect you to go through the law of compensation anymore. Remember, I've talked about this a few times already. That that actually what happens is that God's grace now passes through you once you enter that relationship, and what that means then is that you do not have to experience all of the pains and sufferings that go, f that go along with the emotional healing. You just need to be open to do, do that. You need to g be open to experience the emotion of it. And so in Cornelius' uh, uh, servant's case, Cor Cornelius's faith had affected his ho whole household and, and his servants who looked after him and, you know, and cooked for him and did all of those kind of things for him. Um, they all um, were very much enthused by Cornelius's own enthusiasm for the truth. And so what happened was that uh, because of that, they all had faith in the divine message, the message of truth that I was presenting. And, and because of that faith, they could be healed with God's love uh, rather than just being healed through a spirit or some other method. And because of that faith, they also could. Uh, they they also had an openness to dealing with their emotions as well, but it's actually the faith connection that matters more than anything with regard to healing. It's more that connection than anything else. So even even if you're still feeling unwilling to deal with certain emotions, as long as you have faith that you will be healed, already that means that you've got this great trust in God, 
And it's the great trust in God that allows God to actually heal you and connect with you and heal you. And an emotional faith, not just a mental one. Yeah, not here, but here in your heart. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, the key is to have faith that uh, you, you will have to work, you will have to allow the experience of emotion. But um, if you have faith, a lot of times what happens if you have faith in God healing you, what happens uh, is that you can be healed the instant you are willing to just let the emotion flow. So you don't even have to have released the emotion. You can just allow, as long as you have a complete willingness to let the emotion flow and you have faith in God, you can be healed from any physical issue that you have. No, no, I'm not saying the emotional release comes after. I'm saying the emotional release will happen during the process. You follow me? Yeah. Because the, the emotional, the, the, the love enters you as the emotions leave you. Like, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. you could think of it like a double-ended bottle, you know, where, where there's only enough room to fill something up when something's running out the bottom. You follow me? And, and so I can keep filling it up. Keep, so God can keep topping up, topping up, topping up your soul with her, her love as long as you're letting your emotional baggage flow out of the bottom. As soon as you block that process, then God can't give you more love. Right? And that's why the emotions are essential in the process. As soon as you block that process, you're going to actually block also God being able to give you love. So the majority of us actually open the tap on the bottom of our bottle, it starts flowing, then it gets so intense for us emotionally that we then just turn it off again. Right? And as soon as we turn it off again, we're also unknown, unknowingly are turning off the flow of God's love coming into us if our soul is longing for that love. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So the key is to have the emotions flowing and allow the emotions to flow continually. And, and when you do that, then God's love can also enter you. Once you get God's love, you don't lose it again. Yep. Um, so with you, right? You might have quite a lot of love from God. How come there's any space for error in that song? Um, error is something that doesn't. Uh, you could you could liken it to the soul is the soul grows in its capacity. It's not like a finite bottle that never changes in size. So as your soul grows it has the capacity to experience more and more and more emotions. Now, when you start closing down your soul, you close it down, the emotional baggages, and, and be careful, um, perhaps I should say one thing about my illustrations first, which I said in the first entry as well. An illustration is only good to, to, to <coughs> um, describe a certain point. No analogy should be taken too far. Do you understand what I mean by that? You see, a lot of times what happened in the first century, I would give an illustration and then everyone would go into their mind and try to apply this analogy in all sorts of different ways. Right? Now, the illustration of the bottle is just there to show you that if your emotions are flowing, then God can add more love to you. The truth is that whether whatever state you're in, a 20-second sphere state or a first sphere state, if you stop your emotions from flowing, then naturally God's, none, no more of God's love can enter you. So your soul will have that amount of love in it, but no more of that love can enter you. And that's as far as the analogy should be taken. Right? The soul will still be able to absorb negative emotion, just like it can absorb positive emotion. And the soul will always be in that condition. So you will continue to absorb emotion in your entire experience. Whether it's positive or negative is going to be very dependent upon what condition you're in at the time and how, how you experience the emotion. Does that sort of understand where I'm coming from? So don't, don't take a lot of these illustrations that I give you as if like now you can apply it universally because it will only apply to the discussion that we're having at that moment. Yeah. In order to help you conceptualise what's going on within your own soul. But to be honest with you, your soul is much grander than what you capab are capable of understanding at this point. And, and so what I'm trying to do is give you illustrations that you can relate to, to understand your own soul. Yeah. This is something you talked about yesterday that I just wanted to clarify. Um, my mum has cancer, quite a bit of cancer, and um, she was in hearing and um, healing her in bed and has told her that she doesn't have cancer. And she's had this vision of and 
Sorry, I didn't hear the vision she was having. Oh, Jesus is standing at the end of the bed yeah. and has been healing her very well. And you said yesterday that um, that could actually be her spirit guide providing her with that picture and not necessarily Jesus. Yep. Um, Can I ask where her cancer is? Uh, it's uh, well, through her breast, but she's had a breast removed. Yep. Pec muscles are standing up. What, what side of her body? Left side. But it's also um, both sides of the neck and potentially in her lungs. It's through her throat. So it began in the breast, though, didn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's all emotional, yeah. certainly, and it's to do with some emotion she has about guilt, and uh, she has she can't allow herself to stop doing things for others. Um, even now that she's got cancer, she's still doing things for others, and that's what's creating her illness. Now, the truth is that from God's perspective, we don't have any illness because we're, because that illness is of our own creation. So, so we need to understand that although, although it's real and it does feel have certain feelings associated with the pain and so forth, it, it, it's of our own creation and we need to understand that. Now, spirits can certainly help her and heal her, but not while this emotion exists within her that's creating the illness. So, so, so no matter how much healing energy is given to her, um, what will happen is that she will still unless she deals with the emotion and releases the emotion, she will still continue to create the illness. Yeah. 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 And I think, yeah, she's very aware of that, but it's just... She's, she's aware of it intellectually, yeah. but unwilling to face the emotions yeah. that create the illness. Yeah. yeah. And so what she's looking for is a solution to her pain, <coughs> but, but not yet willing to look at the emotional cause of what's going on within herself. Yeah, you know, I mean to experience that emotion. Yeah. yeah. So, I've so. actually tried to talk to her about exactly that. Yeah. And there's just a real, there's a no, like you say, intellectual knowing, but just doesn't want to go there. And I guess she's wearing the consequences of that. She is. And there's a part of her that does want to pass. Yeah. As well. She said that as well. Yeah. So. And that's preventing her from accepting any emotional truth about the issue as well. Okay. Yeah. So the key, the key is to, um, you know, at some point demonstrate to her that whether she passes or not, mm. she will still need to deal with the emotion, yeah. Yeah. because this emotion will plague her when she passes, yeah. uh, and if she, you know she'd be far better off to deal with it now, yeah. or deal with as much of it that she can now, yeah. uh, rather than waiting until she passes. But she sort of has this viewpoint that all the pain will be over when she passes, mm -hmm. and that's not true either. And it's a false belief she's holding on to um, in, in, a, in her exhaustion. Yeah. 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 Sorry? I'll pass it on. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it'll have much effect oh. on her at the moment because it, it, uh, it's to do with her own willingness to face her own emotional issue. Mm. Yeah. But the healing energy certainly can come from a spirit, but it won't be a divine love spirit who's healing her except in the moments that she displays faith. And in those moments it will be a divine love spirit. She can, you know, a spirit who's practicing the divine love path is a higher spirit than the natural love spirits. Um, and then, you know, they would heal her. Yeah. But at the moment she's being healed by some natural love spirits and they're, and they're creating faith because of her faith in Jesus. Yeah. So they create her faith by, by actually projecting an image of myself to her um, and that makes her get into a state of faith where they can then heal her, if yeah. that makes sense. They can, but they can only partially heal her because she's not willing to deal with or address the emotions. Yeah. Something, I got a, an email recently about a Hawaiian shaman yep. who catalyzed the healing of a whole ward of criminally insane people mm -hmm. without interacting with them. He just looked at their files, mm -hmm. read all the stories about their horrific behavior, mm -hmm. looked at their photos and apologized to them and, and said I love you over and over and over. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem to have any active participation in this process. Mm -hmm. They were all healed. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, when you say they didn't have any active participation well, in the process, not apparently, but yeah, be careful of be careful of <coughs> determining or, or or trying to separate the spirit life experience from the earth life experience. You see, when when we feel somebody loving us, mm -hmm. so when when a person's forgiving us, what they're actually doing is loving us, and that process of forgiveness has a great benefit to our own soul, right? In terms of la allowing us to be open, open. Now, in the sleep state, many of these criminals may have been quite open, and they may not be open in the awake state. So that would cause them to be partially healed from a lot of things, but there will still need to be awake state processing. So the key is, in the end, all persons will need to do processing of emotion in their own awake state. Mm. So they became healed enough... Healed enough to, to be, be more malleable. ...to leave the hospital. Yeah, yeah. And, and see, many, many criminals are actually not, many criminals are actually not criminals in themselves, but they are heavily influenced by spirits who are criminals. You follow me? So many uh, criminals in psychiatric institutions are actually, are actually being heavily influenced by spirits. And a lot of times all you need to do is direct, the, direct forgiveness at those spirits where the spirit feels, because a lot of times it's their own shame and their own guilt and a lot of other emotions that keep them doing what they're doing. And a lot of times all you need to do is direct that feeling to those spirits, which is what this shaman was doing. I see. And that causes a disconnection straight away between the spirit and the person on earth. So the person on earth can change quite rapidly, seemingly with no emotional processing. You follow me? Yes. Because they've been mostly expecting or experiencing the emotions of the spirit. Right. They, so they still attracted those spirits. They attracted yeah. those spirits because of their own yeah. condition, but uh, but the spirit was right. heavily influencing them throughout the entire process of their criminal activity. So they were sane enough to be released, and then they would have to go on and do some more healing themselves or whatever. Or yeah. Become... Or what would happen is another spirit would come along and I connect see. to them, and before you know it, they'd get into a similar condition. Right. So. All of these kinds of healings are not permanent to the person on earth until the person on earth deals with their emotional healing. It's very good for the spirit because the yes. spirit's now disconnected from a person on earth, which means the spirit now is able to face its own emotional processing. And because there's been a person on earth, one person on earth showing them love, because normally for many criminals, not a single person on earth has ever showed them love. Straight away, it's that love that causes them, their heart to change yeah. and causes them to be influenced into, into actually growing and, and accepting more truths in the mm. spirit state. So it's a very, very powerful thing to understand that most, like quite a majority of all these kinds of illnesses and a lot of criminal activity are all based around heavy spirit influence. And, and, and you, can, you can stop the influence by just loving the spirit who's doing it mm. right, and helping them get into a different state because mm. the majority of the spirits are in such an unloving state they've never been loved all their lives on earth all their lives even that's why they become criminals in the first place no. because they've never been loved in their lives on earth generally and then and you know they've never felt love if that's the case and then to have one person on earth after they've passed show them love is a very very powerful thing if the shaman directed the love at the people, would the spirits have still... Well, the shaman was directing love at the, at the, at the individual who created the, the criminal activity, which was actually the spirit, and the I spirit see. would have felt its own responsibility yeah. and, and received that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of very powerful things you can do to actually assist the earth state, and that's, that's one of them. His, this man influenced thousands of psychotherapists yeah. with that because they didn't know that they could do that. Yeah. So it's had a, quite a big effect on that whole yes. yeah. professional. And, and would have even more effect if they knew what they were doing with regard to the spirit attachment. Right. Yeah. So if they knew the truth about the spirit attachment, you could even have a more positive effect again. Um, yeah. mm, thank you. Has everyone uh, finished asking Corny his questions? <laughs> Pretty much. I want to just add some of yours, phrases in relation to what we're saying then. When I was taken, um, the Romans found me and dragged me off to where I had to go to. I didn't have to, but I had no choice. Um, to get tortured and stuff, but there's so many, I felt lots of, um, there's lots of angry women projection, like spirits, around with the people, because they were just resonating with the anger with the people who had 
fuck on earth spirits had their anger they resonated with the people on earth that had the anger and that's a lot of it got put onto me because a lot of their anger actually they got back what they wanted to do to me sort of thing which puts them in a worse state in the spirit world but they felt you know better about that kind of thing that's why i feel it's a lot of i couldn't understand why i have when a woman anger comes towards you know i just want to run away from it it's never been didn't, didn't understand that, but understood that when I experienced that because of that, the projection of anger wanting to harm me because of what I'd done. Mm-hmm. From the spirit world. Yeah, from the spirit mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. But I'm done now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Am I done? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think it's probably appropriate time to have a break. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'll just have a short, uh, sort of hour long maybe discussion. So everyone has a handout of the denial of the soul. Is that right? Yep. Mm, okay, good. Okay. Now, what I wanted to do firstly is just remind you what the soul is. So can we start that? Mm-hmm. What is the soul? You tell me. Desires, passions. It's your desires. Your emotions. Passions. Emotions. Emotions. Aspirations. Aspirations. Whoops. Personality, the love you've developed. It, how, it contain, it's a container of love as, as well, isn't it? So it's got love, memories. or maybe even a lack of love, right? And it's got memories. That'll do us. There's a lot more, isn't there? Two influences on the soul. What are they? Error. And error. So truth and error. Okay. Now, truth enters you emotionally. Error enters you emotionally. It's very important to understand that. Understanding anything here in your mind is totally pointless. Maybe I shouldn't say totally pointless. Mm. It does have a point in that it might open you up here, Mm. if you understand it. But it doesn't guarantee that if you know it here, that it opens you up here, does it? In fact, in many times, if you know it here, you're tempted to deny it. (laughs) here. So the majority of times what happens with this is we tell ourselves, one of the denials that we have is we tell ourselves, I already know that, when in reality, emotionally, we have not got it yet. We haven't got it here in our heart, right? So that even is a tool of denial in itself. So here's God. There's God's soul. There's the connection that we have. Remember that's called the Holy Spirit connection, isn't it? And it's through that connection that the divine love flows. Flows into the soul. (coughs) And if we could think of our soul, like I was illustrating before, as like a container. The only way that this can flow in is that any desires, passions, emotions, and aspirations and so forth that are in emotional error will need to flow out. So you'll need to release them. You'll need to release what's going on within yourself emotionally. So we're okay with that? That's our soul. Remember, we went through the human soul last discussion in Brisbane, and that's what we came up with. All right. So what is the denial of the soul? Well, firstly, we need to understand that our soul creates everything. It's not your mind. It's not your intellect that is your power. It is, in fact, your soul that creates everything. Now, that being said, we need to understand the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect is that every single thing that's happening in my life right now is created by a cause that is inside of my soul. So all of the nice things that happen to you, they are created by causes inside of your soul that are harmonious with love. And all the not-so-nice things that happen to you are created by causes that are within your soul that are not harmonious with love. Does that make sense? So, if we want to become more and more closer to God, then what we will need to do is release from us the causes which are all emotional within us that cause us to stay away from God. Now, the problem is that the majority of us are very resistive to that process very resistive to that process. That process is going to mean our soul, this soul, 
and just take God away from the picture for a moment. Take those truth and error influences away. This soul is going to have to experience all of its held emotion, all of its frozen emotion. So that means every single emotion from the moment you were conceived, or the moment you incarnated, you could say, till now, every emotion that you have not fully experienced has been locked up inside of you and will need to be experienced. And if you're in a state of full openness to your own soul, that will just flow out of you like a child. So you, what does a child do? If it's, if it's sad, it... Cries. If it's angry, it... Stops. Yeah. If, it, if, it's, uh, you know, if it's joyful, what does it do? So can you see there's an instant response? Does it have to work out what to do? No. Does it even analyze what it's doing? No. So this is where you will get in the end, into that same state, where you're not analyzing a single thing you're doing, you're not looking at what you're doing all the time, rather you're just feeling, feeling upon feeling upon feeling, emotion upon emotion upon emotion. And because you've released all of the ones that were error-based, <coughs> 